It may not look like it in the Northland, but garden planning is underway. We have some ideas for new vegetables you might want to try, a look at strategic planting along the shore of the Big Lake, and answers from the experts right here on this edition of Great Gardening. It really is a special environment. I love the organization of the petals. It's a campanula, campanula conglomerata. Hummingbirds will go there, the bees are all over the place. Urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. It's time for another new season for a program. And so we are here with professional gardener and landscaper Tom Casper, an educator and horticulturist, Bob Olin. Welcome back. You know, it's April. It's been snowing out there, but you guys are undaunted. You're ready to talk gardening, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> Seventh month in a row that we've had snow, you know, because it started in... October and uh, that's the unfortunate. The fortunate is is that spring's just around the corner. It certainly is. Yeah. Fortunate is this is supposed to be spring, right? <laughs> <laughs> By the calendar. And the good news is we're getting some of the moisture we need. The good news is that our good friends at NOAA are predicting a good average season. They're saying the next couple of weeks will mm -hmm. be cold, and then we're going to start to loosen things up a li little bit. I loved your intro where you, where you said that it's time to be planning. It's not time to be planting yet. No, but planning. Planning. no tea yes. there yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but soon. That's uh, right. Two, Very three soon. Weeks. And we hope you enjoy our, our new decor and our surroundings. The set's been spruced up and we want to um, especially thank our friends from Serendipity, the Home and Garden Vintage Gift Store on Superior Street in Duluth. Uh, lakeside neighborhood. They helped us out with the decor. Yeah, some fun so stuff. thank you to them. Also with us are phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners who are here to answer the phones because as always this program is for you in the community who have questions about gardening, ones that you may have been pondering over the winter months. You can call the numbers there on your screen 788-2844 locally. We have a toll-free number or you can email us at askgardening at WDSE Dot org. Well, we begin with a look at the conditions outside. Now, the, there are actually some signs of spring out there. <laughs> Despite like the that. ice and snow <laughs> that we see on Twin Ponds, look, spring hawk count is That's underway. Right. And uh, we have people out watching for birds. We also have these tiger lilies coming up oh. in a yard in Superior. Our photographer Ted Pellman took these. and. Some crocuses are just poking out of the ground, so and, it, and it won't wanted, be long. And Ted wanted to point out in that picture that the rabbits have already trimmed. They've a already trimmed a little <laughs> pussy willows, which are great to see this time of year. So yeah. definitely rabbits signs. Love gardens too. <laughs> yeah, definitely signs that uh, spring is on the way. We also have a beautiful photo from last spring of a cedar waxwing. This was sent in by a man. I think he was from Maple, Wisconsin. Dwayne es Esselstrom, and he asked, why are wax wings attracted to apple blossoms in the spring? Well, they're, they're really mostly attracted to some of the old fruit that might still be on the tree. Uh -huh. they, they, uh, that's their primary or their favorite sort of food. So the other thing would be the insects that might be in that area. They might sure. be uh, after flies and, and uh, aphids and things like so that. So they're not so. eating the flowers themselves? Generally they're, not. Okay. No. Yeah. No, there's not, there may be a little nectar there, but they're really not nectar feeders, mm -hmm. you know. So, but I did like that photograph. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm glad you clarified that it was last spring. Either that or maple's <laughs> a lot warmer than we are right here. <laughs> God's country out there, I guess. I see, yes, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, a city garden that serves a popular local restaurant has found success with some unique vegetables, which go from garden to table in a matter of minutes. My name is Rita Bergstead. A lot of people just call me Rita B. I am standing in Chester Gardens on 19th Avenue East and 8th Street. This is our third summer and uh, we built it using raised beds. They're all tamarack tamarack or cedar. We like to grow varieties that are more interesting and something that uh, you wouldn't find in your average uh, 
produce supplier. And so I go with uh, vegetables that are deeper in color, uh, richer purples and reds. I think anything with more color to it has more nutrients in it. We are able to start things in the greenhouse here uh, so we ha can get a little leg up on certain things. And the amazing thing about gardening in Duluth, especially in a big open sunny place like this, is that you can oftentimes have three turnovers of plantings in a bed, and that's because of our long days. We try to provide them with, with the freshest vegetables and some vegetables maybe that they're not getting from other local farmers. And uh, so we try to find a niche that works really well. And the cafe doesn't have any problem with using everything that I grow. We have emptied um, several beds of bib lettuces. You could put lettuce out as early in the season as you can work the soil. We will hopefully have a wonderful fall uh, harvest of an assortment of lettuces because fall is a good time to grow them as well. I love our little greenhouse and shed and we've got water in there of course we needed that for the greenhouse but we also have a station there for washing. I love the visibility. From what I hear from people that I talk to it gives them a great deal of joy even even to drive by but we get a lot of people just parking and walking through. We try to make sure each bed is labeled so that they can look to see what, what variety and what's growing there if they don't recognize it. I think urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Here's a look at some of what's grown for the Chester Creek Cafe. Uh, the Magic Molly Purple Potato, again, those deep pigments, which um, provide a lot of nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, Amarosa Fingerling, which is a beautiful, deep pink colored potato. Then they're growing red swan bush beans. I think those, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, those start out red and then when you boil them they turn green? Most do, yes. Some okay. of the, we lose some of that uh, anthocyanin in the process, in the boiling process. Okay. And then we have some sun gold tomatoes. Those are grown there as well. And uh, as Rita said, she likes to try different things. So maybe there'll be different varieties in those beds come yeah. this spring or, and summer. And it's always fun to see what they're growing there and, yeah. and the plants that are coming up. They're so well taken, such mm -hmm. a nice little asset to that restaurant. So. Yeah. And again, the urban gardening. So it really, you don't need a lot of space. The nice thing, she made the comments, I think that if you have limited space, some of the lettuces and some of the greens make sense. And this succession planting is really the, a good way to get a continual crop as you go through the season. But lots of color. That's a big theme everywhere in, uh, in many, many crops. We saw it in the potatoes and um, in the Swiss chard and other things. And you do definitely pick up these phytonutrients that people are talking about. Uh, so if you want to live forever, right? Uh, make sure you get some <laughs> Magic Molly uh, potatoes, <laughs> potatoes in your diet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They're magic. <laughs> well, it's a good, a good name, one of the older heirloom uh, purple varieties. Okay. Yeah. We also have with us, Tom, uh, you brought us some um, bulbs and roots and just tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, uh, a couple different things here. This is uh, a canna and a dahlia root, mm -hmm. uh, you refer to them as balls, and a lot of people do, but they're really technically... Technically a root? They're technically a rhizome, which is a ah. uh, swollen stem tissue. Um, but you can see we've got, so we've got the roots here and then the, the uh, rest of the plant. And, and these I stored over the winter, and a lot of folks are interested in growing these. Of course, dahlias are becoming more and more popular. Um, and and a little bit difficult, especially with our newer homes, to find a place to overwinter them. Right. <coughs> excuse me, where the uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. where the uh, the temperature is right for them. They really need to be about 50 degrees okay. uh, throughout the winter time, or low mid 40s to upper 40s. So right in that. So what do we need to watch for now once we take them out? Um, you, what, a couple things you want to do as you're starting to get these ready or looking at them, they're almost to the point where you can plant them. You really want to look at the uh, the tissue on the plant and make sure that it's it has some firmness to it, so it's not rotting. If it is rotting, 
coming in and trimming that off so that rot doesn't spread to the rest of the plant. And then um, same with the canna roots. These you can actually, oops, you can uh, take these off if you want and they will re-sprout for you. You could cut this and have two plants where there were one and really do really? a lot of dividing with cannas very easily. So. And how much lead time? Because you know those cannas get so large, the huge leaves, they're gorgeous, but they grow pretty darn fast. Yeah, um, depending on what you have for conditions to get these started, if you've got a greenhouse, you could really get them going in the next three, two to three weeks if you're at home and in, in a window and you really have to wait for warmer climates to plant them out. You really don't want to start them till probably the second week of May or so. Okay. so. All right. I think gardeners, you know, really are anticipating the season. We tend to rush things a little bit because you got to think a little bit about where is it going to go once I've got it sprouted and if I don't have a good greenhouse to work with. Uh, they're frost sensitive, so we've got to be a little careful we don't start too early. Yeah, and, and they in, in both of these would be just fine if you waited till uh, late May to plant them directly out into the soil, even early June, you're still gonna get plenty of growth and lots of flowers throughout the growing season. Okay. So. That reminds me, I had an emailed question from Bobby, and it is, when will you guys start putting seeds out in the garden? I look at the extended forecast, but I'm never sure when to plant. And that's a question that people have every year. Really good questions. You wanna kind of break it out. Am I putting a frost sensitive transplant in? And that'd be things like peppers and tomatoes. We're always looking at the, still looking at the first week in June, even if we might be warming up a little bit. If we're going to be direct seeding, salad crops can go in probably the first uh, first week in May. Um, I think that um, if you're going to use untreated seed, one of the real critical things there, you don't have any fungicides on there, so don't make the mistake of going into cool, wet soil. So if you're going to plant your your prize 100 pound pumpkin seeds and they're untreated because you want to stay organic. You just want to make sure those soil temperatures are at least about 45 degrees. We're looking at the, the end of May there. So really, a couple of breaks. May 1 for the most resistant materials, uh, the salad materials, uh, the onions and so forth that can take cooler temperatures. Late May for direct seeding uh, some of the warm season crops when, when temperatures warm and then the first week in June for some of our cool set, uh, cool uh, warm season frost sensitive transplants. Okay. Well, say that three that times fast. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't make it the first time. I think I got it the second All right. time. <laughs> Speaking of onions, um, Mylan from Duluth wants suggestions for some varieties of sweet onions, either seed or sets. And maybe you can tell us the difference. Okay. First, we're going to be talking about what they call sets, which is a small bulb that was grown the previous season, dug and lifted, and then retailed out this year or transplant. Seed, uh, farther south you could direct seed, but onions we don't direct seed. It's either gonna be the small bulblet or it's gonna be the transplant. Most people have better results with the transplants. Uh, number of really good varieties. You want a nice, large, sweet Walla Walla does very nicely for us. Uh, candy does nicely. You wanna look for long day varieties. If you want keeping varieties, uh, really the some of the sweet Spanish and Copra is a great keeping variety. Mm, so. Okay. Uh, you, you get to play with them a little bit, but what you really want to look for is you want to look for long day varieties because they bulb up in the northern part of the growing region in the United States as the days are getting longer. Okay, great. And, and folks that want to start onions from seeds really would want to be doing that right now if they haven't yet. Or about six weeks ago. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> you might want to be buying from, I know a few reputable dealers you yeah. can buy, yeah. buy some transplants from. You think so? Yeah, I think so, you yes. You think maybe, okay, you know, <laughs> know a few, okay. Um, just quickly before we move on, Tom, um, my, my lilac bush was trashed by the windstorms. Will the flowers come back this year? <clears throat> Excuse me, um, depending on what, how much, how much how of it much? was trashed. Yeah. Uh, Depending on, uh, again, how much of the top of the plant is gone, if, if it was taken down, it's gonna start over. It's gonna take a couple of years before it blooms again. Um, if the person, the caller, didn't lose that top portion of the plant, more than likely those buds are fine and she should get flowers or they should get flowers this year, so. Okay. You know, Tom, we get that question because you might have a very mature plant. Generally, it's a real woody material that doesn't come back very well. So it's younger, it's more pliable, you can see some green tissue there. Those you can prune up pretty well, but if we snapped it down closer to the base, in some cases you might have to 
we say prune at ground level and let it re-sprout from the roots. Yeah, and then it takes a couple of years. Will so. take a couple of years, yeah. We'll get back to more questions in just a bit, but right now it's not just restaurants in Duluth providing a garden experience for customers. Last summer we visited a bed and breakfast where landscaping features are designed to serve the needs of guests and the lakeshore setting. We are Brian and Mary Grover, and we live on Park Point, about 12 houses from the lift bridge on the lake side, and we own and operate So Glimped Bed and Breakfast, and welcome to our garden. I think we spent a lot of time, too, trying to get things to take and keep them watered because of the sand down here, and to keep them alive when, through the winters when they're being beat up by a lake wind, so this is why we have this secret garden, we call it, over here on this part of the house. All of the uh, sandstone patio in this part here in our secret garden are all uh, original sandstone bricks out of the avenues that were taken out when the I-35 freeway was put in through Duluth. So it was getting it all to fit in right and then and then landscaping around it and then dealing with these big popples too that our original, you know, all this fun sedum, that came from one of the ladies in the Park Point Garden Club, and it really has gone everywhere. And then our astilbes and more hosta. That's what the cedars do now. It helps to, you know, absorb the wind when it's coming off the lake to, I mean, it still takes a fair amount of a beating back here, but, it's, but it um, helps to break it a little bit. We've tried to have trees trimmed up and stuff so we've got the visual interest and yet, you know, we need to have for the guests, we need to have the view, they're, you know, they're coming to see the view. I think it makes a cool picture through the trees with the bridge. That is a linden, American linden. I planted those quite a few years ago now. Uh, as a conceivable replacement if these popples gave way. We have all these different sitting areas everywhere, so uh, you have a lot of privacy uh, depending on where you are. Early morning, early morning coffee is yeah. popular, that they'll yeah. get coffee and, and come and sit outside and you know walk on the beach. And... Oh, oh, that Japanese maple. maple that we have, and that's a nice, that's lived for us well. It, it's just nice and um, protected back there. We have the waterfall in the front. We would notice when people are stopped for the bridge, they would roll down their window to hear the water. And so when Brian did this one, it was kind of that idea of transferring the water, the sound from the lake here to the waterfall and out. This has all been here probably six years. They live in the garage over the winter. They come back out in the spring. It's called parrot's feather. It's a water plant. The larch came in 91 when my dad died and I bought that larch. And so we call that George because that was my dad's name. The red and the purple on the porch, that's all again for the purple front door, you know, just to kind of keep that color theme going. This is our 17th season. It's been such a fun lifestyle for us and met so many people. Lovely residence yeah. and business there in Park Point. Yeah, Mary's been a Park Point gardener for decades really? um, and, and part of the Park Point uh, Garden Club down there that does just beautiful things on right. the point. So. Okay. And we got to give Brian credit too. I mean, he's got all his artistic flair. That's and, uh, right. So what a combination. It is. And, uh, it's a good it's combo. nice to see them both and it's nice to see it featured. We really appreciate it. You're doing a great job. Them uh, giving us the tour. Okay, time for questions now. And we also have 
a picture to consider. This comes from Steve, who says he was in the woods picking raspberries when uh, he found this growing from a rotting aspen log. So what is this, some kind of fungus? Well, it definitely is. It's one of the mushrooms, and I don't know exactly which one it is. And obviously, this is, was not taken uh, this year. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, very, very decorative, but uh, rather unique. It's certainly not one of the shelf mushrooms, one of the, the wood, uh, wood eating mushrooms. And I wouldn't know what that one is. Tom, you want to grab I'm that? not sure either. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool looking, though. Yeah, it looks no. neat. Um, Marilyn from International Falls says, my bulbs are coming up now. Do I need to protect them from the cold? Mm. Uh, she points out it was three below at night, or last, I don't know if that's last night or expected tonight. Yeah, the next few days are going to be pretty cold. So yeah. certainly up against a foundation, you know, you're getting a lot of that heat radiating out from that the foundation of a home. So they might be okay, but uh, also with these kind of temps, if she does have stuff coming up, wouldn't be a bad idea if she's got a way to protect them. Yeah, you know, we've got some frost-resistant materials. Garlic is a great example. Pop up early, and a lot of these can take about 20 to 25 degrees. But when we talk about zero, which is really unusual, if you have to peel some straw back, I always tell people leave it in place and then protect because even if it doesn't kill them, it sets those growing tips back and the plant's got to restart sometimes. Mm -hmm. so. Rhonda from Pengilly asks, uh, what do you suggest for a soil mix to use in containers? Oh, there's lots of product out there. Yeah. Um, we kind of like mixing our own vermiculite, perlite, peat moss, and then uh, we'll share this little secret, a little bit of a sandy loam. Uh, mineral soil so we pick up all the trace nutrients so good drainage and a pasteurized mix with something that has those trace nutrients in it right. and you're going to be just fine so even if you're buying the packaged mix mixes it doesn't hurt to uh, work up a little bit of your own as well okay michael from aurora has some plants he started in his basement but there's white mold on top of the soil what causes this and what can i do about it well, again, we've got the or organic component, organic fraction. You're going you're gonna to see that very frequently, actually. And uh, cooler, moist conditions, a lot of them are kind of benign. If you just scrape it off and throw it off, uh, you know, it's not a major problem. The, the ones that really cause us problems, like the rhizox, pythium, and damping off, those we hardly mm -hmm. see, and they do all the damage, yeah. don't they? Yeah, so, so he'll want to yeah. cut back on his waterings. Uh, and if he can get a fan going, um, to really get that air circulation sure. as much as possible in there, so. Okay, uh, Kelly from Cloquet has an azalea bush, but says, I took big flower heads off in the fall. Will they come back? Yes, okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of times, and folks ask, we've had that question a couple of times with different flowers that after they bloom, they kind of just hang there. So the buds were formed in August. The flower buds were formed in August and September of last year. So if something hasn't taken those flower buds, i.e. a deer or rabbit, <laughs> something mm -hmm. like that she should have flowers this spring on the plant again okay so. great well time now to show off the photos sent in by friends of great gardening here's this week's grow and show brenda carlson grows a bright yellow icelandic poppy in her gardens in cloquet different varieties of purple iris sprout from a bed that borders the walkway Brenda says she tries to support the bee population with plantings of bee balm, phlox, and lilies. Her success with peonies includes this Sarah Bernhardt with vibrant pink ruffles. The delicate, lighter blush-colored peony is a Dorothy J. Brenda tried her hand at fairy gardening last season and says the fairies seem to really like it. Meanwhile, her fern adored its eastern exposure alongside the deck so much, Brenda says it quadrupled in size, prompting her to dub it Seymour, named for the Little Shop of Horrors plant. The sunflowers in Dorothy Harrison's gardens attract butterflies en masse for this picture-perfect moment at her Duluth flower bed. If you have flying friends that alight in your garden, or planting successes you'd like to share, send pictures to greatgardening at wdse.org. Please keep those pictures coming in. We'd love to share them and see uh, what successes you had last season, of course. Um, we probably have time for just one more question, but this is interesting. Olivia from Duluth wants to know, how do I compost organics indoors with red wiggler worms? Well, there you go. There's your indoor composting. They actually, 
this is kind of a science and an art called vermiculture, worm composting. There are a few little secrets. You gotta get the red wigglers. Uh, you gotta keep them alive. You gotta be a little warmer maybe than what people think. You can't have them hopping out of the container. And they do a, <laughs> they do a great job of composting. Uh, jumping worms? Jump, jumping <laughs> worms, yeah. Actually, that's a topic for another day. We yeah, do have a few day. jumpers, <laughs> but I will say this. There are some techniques for that. And uh, you know, we have a program coming up on that very yeah, topic. Yeah, the Spring Garden Extravaganza is coming up, and that's a, a week from Saturday. And you're going to be talking about that a little well, bit? Well, it's one of the 13 breakout sessions. Okay. We have one on vermiculture, an expert, really, uh, Beth Wemkin, that's going to be talking specifically on worm composting. Of course, we've got uh, my good colleague here. You might miss Tom Tom's, Casper will be there. Tom's session yeah. on designing with perennials. Okay. But uh, are they going to pick the worms over your designing <laughs> session? I don't know, but there's going to be right. a lot to see. Well, we, that's me. on our website. We <laughs> encourage people to go to our website for more information and our schedule. But we uh, want to say a big thank you to our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners. Of course, you guys, Tom Casper, Bob Olin, thanks so much for great advice and really good energy as always. Thanks to all of you who called in and tuned in. We'll be back next week with more great gardening.